here is, so you kind of heard this morning when we're talking about the networks, the Neuronex is kind of a network that has probably more junior um, PIs than some of the other networks that focus on more later things. So what, I, what I'm going to try to do is, is give you some um, general overview discussion of the clinical trial design, which might be kind of relevant to what you're discussing in your small group, but in a way based more on what our experience in Neuronex is, again, not necessarily stand up here and this is this design, this is that design, and more of that dynamic. To, to kind of set the foundation, let me kind of throw out, this is your statistics 101 for this morning, just to make everyone uh, happy, especially the clinicians that we love uh, talking about statistics uh, in the setting. But the, the one big thing that I think kind of drives this whole discussion, and, and based on not just my experience with neuronics, but others, is there's a concept that you'll hear a lot uh, when you talk about clinical trials, clinical trial equal voice, right? Where kind of unethical to launch a trial if it doesn't have equal voice, where there's a reasonable amount of uncertainty as to whether the treatment is better or, or worse, right? That's how you justify the randomness of putting somebody to, to you know, disease control, treatment control, and so forth. That being said, when you get into the nitty gritty of design, never is a strong word. I would almost say never, but I'll stick with seldom have I ever worked with an investigator that was getting ready to design a trial or ready to launch a trial that wasn't pretty much convinced that what they were studying worked, right? I mean, that's why they're willing to invest their life in it, right? Let me draw a parallel. There are also many groups that when you submit a grant application, you're reasonably confident that you've written a really good grant application and that it's really strong. How many times does the grant application hit, right? Even though you're confident that it was good at the time you submitted it. I think doing clinical research is a lot like that. And one of the things that comes across in design that I find from a statistical standpoint, right, the statisticians are the pessimists in the room. I was once told by someone that statisticians are the killjoy uh, in the process. But really, a lot of it is backing away from designing a trial convinced that it works, and I just want to show that it works, versus designing a trial to determine whether it works, right? Too many people come into design almost innocent till proven guilty type approach that my drug works until you convince me otherwise, which you don't have any chance to do with what I propose to do, my drug works, right? And so part of it is really stepping back and thinking how can you come up with a reasonable question? And if you almost took the opposite approach, if I'm convinced that it doesn't work, then how can I convince myself that this is worth justifying and moving forward? A couple other things I'll throw out here, just little statistical bits. It would be pretty easy for me if I was working with any of you to design a test that would be more powerful than any other test you could do. It would be a pretty stupid test, but it would be the most powerful. That's just always rejecting your hypothesis, right? That has 100% power, right? It has 100% power under an alternative. The problem is it has 100% power under the null or any other thing you would want, right? So it doesn't have good properties across the board, but that's another thing to keep in mind is that you're looking at not just in the condition where what you think will happen happens, but what happens in many other conditions? You heard Roger talk last night when you're designing simulation studies. You shouldn't just simulate what you think is going to happen. You should simulate a wide range of conditions to make sure you understand the properties. The other thing that I think is important for all of you to understand, and this is to do kind of as consumers of the medical literature. If, if you're sent two abstracts, right? One study, so two positive studies. One has a p-value of 0 0.001. And one has a p value of 0.048, right? So just barely hit the threshold of 0.05. Which one has the more convincing evidence? Which is the strongest effect? That's a good response, right? You don't know. But you would be amazed at the number of times people interpret a smaller p value as more convincing evidence. You have to know not just the effect size, but what was the size of the study, right? And you get P value of 0.001 in a study of 10,000 people may be much less convincing than a p value of 0.1, right? Doesn't meet the threshold of 0.05 in a study with only 25 subjects. So it's important to recognize the whole concept of what you're trying to do. So with that being said, I'll try to give you a little bit of background about our experience in Neuronex and talk about a couple of specific things that seem to recur a lot in the types of phase two trials that we've designed in the past six years or so in Neuronex, which parallel a lot of the same types of projects that you guys are working on. So we mentioned kind of the structure of the network with the clinical sites and when we talked about kind of the goals. Um, 
this gives you a sense of what's come in, just to kind of expand on that in terms of the application, but who submits proposals? So most of these come from academic investigators. We have had, so Neuromax has three components, uh, academic investigators, but there's a small business mechanism, and there's an industry mechanism. And the design trials on some levels is the same across those, but in, in many other ways they're very different. So working with industry collaborators is different than working with academic collaborators because there's often other objectives, right? Their objectives based on a lot of the businesses that we collaborate with in Neuralex would be, you know, small biotech companies or companies with maybe limited capital. And a lot of what they're hoping to do is A, through concept type studies, but also generate data that will be available to investors. Uh, so the majority target adult conditions, there was a question earlier about pediatric. About one out of four proposals that come into networks to Neuralex is pediatric. You can see the grant submissions, so there's been 25 initial submissions, 13 resubmissions. This gives you, this also came up, I think, in the discussion about timelines. But in terms of the time from submission to initial uh, grant submissions, about eight to 10 months, right? So that six month window that we talked about in the panel was pretty comparable for about what you would expect uh, coming in. In terms of the time from submission to resubmission is a little longer because you have to wait for review of the uh, summary statement and revise it and so forth. Uh, when we look at the, at the summary statements for the studies that have been um, submitted but not funded, a couple of things that kind of stood out. The scientific rationale or significance is probably the biggest one, especially, you know, Neuronex kind of came uh, about about this time there was this renewed emphasis on rigor in terms of uh, you know, clinical research applications. And so that comes across a lot. And those are kind of, no matter how well you design the study, if it doesn't have a good rationale or significance, that's going to be a problem. Um, other things that come up though would be the dosing, um, PKD. So this gets to what do you, what do you, are you reasonably confident about versus what are you uncertain of going into phase three? And a lot of times, if you're choosing the dose based on cost or convenience, that can be problematic because it will come across in review. You don't have a very good justification for the dose that you've chosen. And it also goes back to what you heard in kind of the keynote yesterday. If you have multiple things you're unsure of and you cast your lot with one of those things, you're open to then ending up with something that maybe is not clear or doesn't necessarily answer the question. Uh, trial design and outcome measures come up a lot. One of the challenges in a lot of neurological areas is there aren't necessarily clear, validated endpoints to use, right? Which leads to a lot of problems when I, so I have my drug, right? I'm a small company X, I got this drug, this is the only drug my company has. I want to do a phase two clinical trial. If my drug works, I want to show that it works, right? But I also want to make sure that I don't miss something that works because that would be pretty catastrophic. So one of the things that we've had come up numerous times when we work with investigators is I don't know which endpoint is best. Um, there's a pool of about eight to 10 that I can choose from. What I'd like to do is try each one because if one of them works, I want to be able to go forward. But the problem with that, if you've had a basic statistics class with multiple comparisons issue, is if you look at enough things, even if there is nothing there, you're liable to hit on any one of them, right? So there is a temptation that if you look at too many things with a lenient enough threshold, you're going to go forward regardless, and you may end up going forward with a type of error. So really thinking about how can you how can you do that? Another thing that commonly comes up with the outcome measures is a desire to try to validate the outcome measure within the clinical trial. There are some people who, who think that's a good idea. Personally, I don't. Um, in some ways, you can't really validate it unless your drug doesn't work. I guess that's the only advantage is you can get something out of it. But if your drug works, you can't really validate your outcome measure because it's somewhat confounded by the drug effect, right? And you can talk about the placebo group and validate that. But it becomes very problematic because there's so many other things going on. And so what you'd really like to have is to use outcome measures that have been studied, validated, or well described and well understood before you run into um, the, the concepts later. In terms of getting more into specific case studies, I have kind of a new appreciation for it. Phase one, phase two, phase three, I mean, these are kind of notations that come up. You can think about them more generally, uh, even in, in drug studies where there's drug devices, kind of confirmatory and learning stage designs, right? Early stage versus the, the confirming stage designs. And I, I always had an appreciation for the challenges of phase two. Uh, since I've been involved with Neuronex, I kind of have a renewed understanding of just explaining exactly how hard those are. Because it's, it's a really awkward position to be in, right? Proof of concept means you're trying to 
you get enough evidence that something works to justify taking it to phase three. But you're not really trying to show that it works, right? And the temptation oftentimes, and having said on study section, I can tell you a number of things would come in, which are the proof of concept is just the mini version of what I want to do for phase three. It's not power for any phase three question. I just want to get data to plan my phase three. Well, that's not really answering the question of interest, right? To go back to what we we're trying to do. There is no go, no go. I mean, the only go is I'm going to get data and I'm going to go, right? There's in essence no, no go uh, with that. But the challenge there with recurrentory designs, there are a lot of problems with, with designing phase three, but it's kind of like you're the kids running in the race here, right? There's lots of kids. If, uh, you know, there's so many things you could be wrong about and still come out okay in the end. Uh, so if you're the kid, you fall down there in the race, you know, there's so many other kids to distract, they're all cute and running, and everybody's watching everyone. Versus with uh, learning stage designs, like proof of concept, you're, you're out there running by yourself, right? You're at the very end of the race. If you're getting close to the finish line and you trip and fall, everybody's at the finish line is going to see, right? So attention to detail, the amount of, for lack of a better term, sloppiness that you can do in a, in a confirmatory stage design is much less in some ways. So an example would be data clean, right? Data management, data come in, we want to clean it, query it. For phase three designs, you can be a little sloppy and just the law of large numbers will pay off for most of the time and you're probably still okay. If you're in a small study, you're not gonna, it's not the same thing's not gonna hold true. And every piece of information may be really critical to making sure that you have information to do that. I'm not proposing to not. Uh, pay attention to all those things, but just the amount of degrees of freedom that you have with respect to being off on certain things is much smaller. So, you know, for any clinical trial, as Eric pointed out this morning, it's important to have an important research question and use rigorous methodology to answer that question and obviously protect your subjects. But the question, it becomes really problematic in smaller studies, proof of concept studies, of what is the question, how do you power that question, how do you do so in a way that is doable right, in a study that's not, in essence, the phase three uh, trial. So really, the importance of study planning is really magnified, and it's really critical to have all the parties together, right? You really need the, the clinical researcher with the IP, you need the statistician, you need the operation people, uh, you know, to come into play there, to really put everything together and make sure all the pieces are addressed in terms of study planning. Um, so you know, a couple of examples of that. So we do early phase. We've actually done some phase one uh, studies. I'll give an example uh, of the one stroke study that Neuronext will do because this came in uh, before uh, stroke net was found. But you know, as Eric mentioned, in phase one studies, you're often looking at safety and trying to find maximum tolerated dose. You know, you, you don't want to miss if the dose is too low, then you may miss a potentially useful drug. If the dose is too high, you may go forward with two. Um, with an unsafe dose. So you want to try to hit it as much as possible. One of the situations that we had in Team M is the uh, Neuronex NN104. It's also ratchet. We have acronyms, but we were very uncreative originally with the Neuronex study. So 101, 102, 103, because uh, we like numbers. Uh, <laughs> um, but so Pat Light and Cedar sinai is the, uh, the PI. And this is a partnership with company CC Biotech. Who, who, the, the, who has a drug called 3K3 APC, and it's doing a maximum tolerated dose study, but there's also some preliminary animal data that suggests that this drug could lower the risk of bleeding, which would be an important thing uh, to know. So that's kind of an important secondary endpoint, which gets into this, uh, you know, it's, the goal of this is not just to find maximum tolerated dose, it's to generate data that would help to A, appeal to investors, and B, provide data to move this to the next level. So it had kind of a nuance in that very few uh, MTD type studies, there are some, but it's not common to have like a placebo group. So this involved placebo randomization in addition to your standard approach. Uh, the other aspect, which some of you may be familiar with and some may not, is in, in dose finding, one of the defaults is you'll hear a lot about is three plus three, right? Three plus three design, which is popular mainly because it's very easy to do. You don't need fancy statistics, you don't need fancy machinery, you, you treat three people on a dose, and depending upon whether zero, one, two, or three have, you know, but if your dose limiting toxicity, however you define it, that determines whether you step up or, or go down or stay at the same dose and so forth. It's easy to implement. You know, anyone in this room could spend probably 30 minutes to an hour with someone explaining the three plus three, you could easily go back and implement it. It came out of oncology settings, right, where it's really optimized, and kind of the three plus three is optimized when you're looking at 
drugs where the target rate of toxicity might be around 30 to 35 percent, right? So where about a third of the people that you treat might have a dose limiting toxicity, which might work well when you're working when you're looking at chemotherapy type drug. In neurological settings like this, where the dose limiting toxicity might be a major bleed, you're not going to be willing to accept that high a risk of the drug. You're probably looking at more of a threshold around 10 percent. And it's pretty easy to show that if you apply a three plus three algorithm with something where you're really wanting to minimize looking at doses with 10% or risk or, or higher, you have a really high chance of overshoot, of going forward with too high of a dose. When you think about it, if you treat three people, the probability of seeing one dose limiting toxicity, if the true rate is 10%, is actually pretty small, right? So you're gonna incorrectly think you have safe doses when it's more the property of you're looking for an acceptable range that's be below what the three plus three was optimized. Now, the challenge that, that I've always had when that comes up in neurological settings is the three plus three is easy to understand. The other type of approaches that might be recommended there would be more of adaptive dose finding type methods. The continual reassessment method is one, there are others. Those are Bayesian approaches where you start off with some estimate and as the data come in, you refit a curve each time and you use this model to determine which dose you would have. Now, the advantages of that is it typically does a better job of A, estimating the dose range, and B, it uses all of the, the data as it comes in. But it's A, harder to understand if you're not familiar with that, particularly if you have no exposure to Bayesian statistics in the past. But B, you really need you know, a statistician or informaticist or someone that can program this, and it has to be rerun every time the cohort comes in. So operationally, it's much more complicated than a three plus three. So if someone comes in wanting a three plus three because they understand it, you're gonna have to convince them why the CRM would be better. And that's exactly the situation that we were in here when we were setting up the 104 study. So because of the placebo group, we did randomization. Uh, they wanted to, it, 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 it's actually, was a, this was a large phase one study because they wanted to get uh, some sense of whether this bleeding risk could be lowered. And so we ended up going with 22 cohorts, so 88 uh, uh, groups uh, with randomized in a three to one within each group with four dose levels under consideration. We actually then, to convince them, had a series of phone calls, explained all of these type of things. But in the end, what really convinced them is if you look at you know, simulation study, looking at a range of conditions, what if none of the drugs you know, are, are safe, what if you know, the dose four, dose three, dose two, and, and various settings. And what you see here are the results of that where the, the middle two columns here or the probability of correctly choosing the maximum tolerated dose. So for instance, if, uh, if dose four is the maximum tolerated dose, what's the probability that you select dose four? If dose three is, what's the probability that you select dose three? But as important, the latter two columns are the probability of overshoot, right? So what's the probability that you would declare a dose higher than the one that is the maximum tolerated dose to be the one that you would select at the end of the study based on that? And you can see that really, Except for at the highest dose, where the CRM does a little best in terms of choosing the best, then if you, the problem is if it's anything but that, then you have a much higher probability of overshoot. Right? The reason the three plus three does better at the highest dose is because it's almost always going to go to the highest dose, right? Because you're looking for 10%. Remember, that's an unlikely event. So if the highest dose is your maximum tolerated dose, you're fine with the three plus three. If there's any other one, you're going to probably go to the highest dose, whether or not it is the truest dose. So showing that really enabled us to convince the investigator team that this was worth pursuing. It was much better suited for what they wanted to do. And these are the type of examples where, A, you know, having a collaborative team that was willing to listen was important, but also kind of the existence of the network infrastructure was helpful. And when I say network infrastructure, what I've predominantly mentioned so far is the clinical and the statistical Right? And that helps from kind of the intellectual you know, capacity to help do this. But equally important, what the network provides is administrative help to help organize these calls. Right? So as Sam can attest, finding time that even one clinician and one statistician can get together with one or two or three junior colleagues is not an easy task. Right? And if you left it to us, it may never happen. So having someone just to help move that forward really increases the ability to do that and makes it much more feasible that you can keep moving forward in the process. Because we're all busy, you know, 
depending on if you catch me the right day, maybe I answer your email, maybe it says that I have to remember it and come back to it and remind me a week or two later. So that's one phase one. Phase two, which many of you may also have been in, these are the uh, proof of concept type studies where kind of the goal was to further characterize, characterize the safety profile and provide assessment of efficacy. I'm gonna step off a minute and go on my soapbox. One of the things that um, I really don't like when someone comes in and says, what's one of your objectives of your trial? I want to show that my drug is safe, <laughs> right? You, I, I bet I've told that once a week. You can't do that, right? You could never design a trial to show a drug is safe. It's the, the black swan hypothesis, right? If, if I tell you all swans are white, you can easily disprove that hypothesis by bringing me a black swan. But if, if you haven't produced a black swan by the end of the day, I still haven't proved that all swans are white. You have to go and get every swan in the world, right, to prove that. It's the same thing. You can easily prove that a drug is not safe by showing that it has adverse risk, but failing to show that it has risk doesn't show that it's safe. We often don't know the full safety profile of drugs even once they're approved. That's why we have post-market surveillance. So, you know, avoid having an objective in your trial to show the drug is safe. What you can do is maybe rule out certain levels of risk, but that's really all you can do in a trial. Now, so, a couple of things that are common things that come up in phase two. Some of these I've alluded to. Um, avoiding early phase designs that look simply to be an underpowered phase three study. I, I, from my experience, I can tell you that nothing is probably the kiss of death more for clinical trial application than this. If you really want to anger a study section, with a clinical trialist do this, and the amount of vitriol in the room is somewhat, um, somewhat scary. You don't, they don't like this. The other part of this that's dangerous is also, even if you're trying to use the trial to estimate data, the treatment of effects that you get in pilot studies are often overestimates of the true effect, right? Because if you do a pilot study and the pilot study is not exciting, you're not going to go forward. You're only going to go forward if the pilot study was exciting. So there's somewhat some inherent bias that just by randomness, if you get a higher you know, effect than, than lower effect, you go forward. So it's somewhat biased in terms of the positive side. So you may, if you use those effects, you may not have the power that you think because you're over optimistic in what you're looking at. And in general, I would argue not to use data to estimate your effect size as much as possible. Use clinical relevance to come up with your effect size, right? What would you need to show to change practice? Not what do I need to power it to show what you know, Joe Hack showed in the prior study. Um, I mentioned about using a large number of endpoints and the, and the dangers with that, and that you would almost always go forward. Um, the other one is, um, and this is the tricky one, when the investigator comes in and they say, I want to do this study, how many do I need? So I need about 500 people. I can only do 200. What can I do? Right? And so at, at that point, it becomes somewhat tricky, right? Maybe you can do what I would call sample size justification, right? What size effect can you show with that sample size? If you could make the case that that's meaningful, maybe that would fly. Um, the, the, the challenge comes when you can't really power for one, but you may say, we want to look at this, and if there's a positive trend, we will go forward. The problem with this is, is, is you know, trends are somewhat subjective, right? And that someone who has convinced something works can look at a plot and become convinced that it shows promising trends that would justify moving it forward. Somebody who's convinced it does not can look at the exact same data and see nothing, right? And so it almost, without kind of some level of, of rigor to justify making the decision, you know, your, your own biases or what you think going in are probably going to drive the decisions that you have at the end. And as much as possible, you'd like to, uh, to avoid that. Um, the other thing that, that is, um, Unfortunately, true. This is this is kind of like the publication bias issue, which you're familiar with. Positive studies are more likely to be published than negative studies, but it's also true in research. Positive early phase studies are likely to generate more excitement than negative early phase studies. The same type of bias for publication carries forward in terms of clinical research. The reason we're doing the phase two proof of concept is because we like something we saw in an earlier phase design, and we're probably going to get more excited. We're probably going to make a bigger deal about that. Um, then maybe we should based on the evidence. That's somewhat human nature, but it's something to keep in mind that you know what we think we know in an early phase is probably stronger than what we actually know at that point. Like right? there's more uncertainty than what we think, or maybe our level of excitement is not justified. Where that becomes really problematic is your your, your patient populations, your patient advocacy populations, right? If there's a you know quote positive phase two study. There's a lot of excitement. And this is even more so now, I think, 
the age of social media where you know patients and groups are more connected than they were 10, 15 years ago. There's a lot of excitement and uh, a lot of, I, I think, you know, kind of lay groups have trouble recognizing what it means for a positive phase two versus a positive phase, phase three and interpret them the same. So everyone gets excited about this promising new finding. The phase three trial is running, and in a few years, if that fails, then they're crushed, particularly if it's a disease area where there are no other treatments, right? And, and it's important, to, I think, to recognize what's not just what do we know, but what's the strength of the evidence that we know, right? How sure are we that, that, that this works? Because if there's a disease where there is no treatment, and this is very much in the news and discussions of, of FDA today, even with the history that Eric talked about, now we're in kind of this renewed discussion of should you know the standards for FDA be relaxed somewhat? How, how, you know, if you know that a drug is safe, what level of efficacy do you need to show? If it's a rare disease, what level of efficacy would that change things? So a lot of this is, is very much in play in terms of discussions that are going on today that are relevant in terms of what we know, how sure are we that it works, how sure are we about the risk, and in general, what's the risk benefit profile? Um, a couple of, of things that we found useful in Neuronex, so there is a, uh, what we call surrogate endpoint design, which is what would be ideal. Uh, for phase two studies, where if you had a biomarker or a surrogate endpoint, where you could do a phase two study on an endpoint that was very predictive of maybe a longer range clinical endpoint, that's a good way to screen things. The problem with that is in a lot of areas we don't have good biomarkers. That's obviously an area of research trying to develop and validate better biomarkers. But we have had one example of that, the NN102 study, or SPRINT MS. This was an MS study uh, looking at uh, an intervention uh, in multiple sclerosis. And this is basically an imaging study, right? So it's using uh, MRI and image brain atrophy as the endpoint, which is um, thought to be a surrogate marker for the clinical endpoints that you would observe over a longer period of time. So the goal of the primary objective of the study is to determine whether the drug as an intervention can slow the rate of brain atrophy in these participants. There's other secondary clinical endpoints that the study is collecting to also get preliminary data in terms of looking for you know, benefits or, or if the study is positive in terms of atrophy, how would you design it moving forward in terms of looking for clinical effects, which would be the next step in this group. Uh, another design that uh, is popping up more and more in the neurology research, uh, and we talked a little bit about this on the webinar, that it has a futility design or a non-superiority design, where the idea is that it kind of flips the, the typical null and alternative hypothesis, where your null hypothesis is that the, the intervention works at least to the effect of what you would determine to be a clinically meaningful effect in phase three. And your alternative is that it does not work that well. So if you reject the null, you would declare it's futile to study this further. If you don't reject the null, you haven't proven that the drug works, it would just provide justification for moving forward. It's a very effective design. I think it suffers somewhat if someone's not familiar with it, and that it has a really awful name that no one wants to design a trial to show that their drug or intervention is fuel. So in some ways, it's unfortunate uh, the name that we have. But once you get past that, I think really understanding it's, it's better than doing an underpowered design, and it gives a way to have some level of rigor in situations where there might be a lot of uncertainty uh, to determine whether it's worthwhile moving forward. It has high negative predictive values because of how it's set up. So if you declare it futility, in a futility design, it's likely that the drug doesn't work. But because you're not proven the null hypothesis, if you fail to show futility, you can't conclude that the drug works, right? That would have to be followed up in a larger uh, confirmatory study. We have an example again there uh, in 103. This is a myasthenia gravis study uh, with, again, an intervention. And this is, I think, a really good example of what Merrick was mentioning this morning, where Richard Nowak, the, the PI here, never left. Uh, a multi-site clinical trial before. So he was a junior investigator who came into the network, very, very green, was eager to learn and work with us, and is now, you know, he's been through, uh, you know, through the trenches and has, has established effective member both of the executive committee and leading the trial. So I think it's a great example of a junior PI who, who was able to learn a lot through the network. He came in, and one of the challenges that they had was, so this was looking at rituximab as a prednisone sparing agent, where the theory was, you put someone on rituximab, you could get them off of high doses of prednisone. And they had done a single center study at Yale that showed that about 8% of the subjects that they treated were able to get you know, reduction in their prednisone dose over, I think it was a one year treatment period. They were able to reduce their prednisone dose by about 75%. So really dramatically decreasing the amount of prednisone 
that these dishes had to be on, you know, over over a long period of time. The objective here was to try to then replicate that in a multi-site trial. The myasthenia gravis is notoriously difficult to recruit. Um, it was going to be a very hard sell to do a phase three trial, um, and so we needed some kind of way to do a proof of concept. Um, but really, there wasn't clear ways to do that without kind of using the same type of, of, of endpoint here that you would do if you did the phase three. So a futility design seemed appropriate there. Of course, the investigators weren't familiar with that. You know, Richard was a junior guy had never heard of it. So a lot of the types of discussions that we had to go about in designing it was similar to what I mentioned in the previous studies, which is explaining what is a futility design, how would it be helpful here, how would it benefit. And so here, what we ended up setting up is if you suppose a 30% increase in favorable response rates is clinically meaningful. So that means if you were designing a phase three trial, you would assume some rate of favorable response just by chance in the placebo group, right? How many, what percentage of the placebo group would have their prednisone doses reduced by 75%? And assume that you needed to show a 30% increase from that, right? So in other words, if 40% of the placebo group is expected to respond, you would need to have 70% or more of the treated group respond in order to have success. That would be clinically meaningful. So the null was that you would see at least that 30% increase versus an alternative that you would not. And what we were able to do then to really help clarify that with Richard with the sample size that we had was showing how this would work, right? Under, if you assume the placebo rate is 40%, you can kind of see the properties here. If, with the, so the top line is different assumptions for the rate of the rituximab rate, right? What would the, the subjects on rituximab have? If it's 40% or less, so rituximab does equal or worse than placebo, you would reject, that's the red area, you would reject with high probability, you would declare futility. Right? If it turned out that it wasn't effective, you would not go further. If it turned out that Rituximab had a 70% or greater, so that's that 30% increase, right? If it truly had a 30% increase or not, you would reject only 10% or fewer. The 10% was our type 1 error, that's the alpha level that we're using here, right? So that would be type 1 error in this example. If you're in the middle, between 70 and 40, you've got some moderate level of the ability to declare futility, but that's kind of expected because that's the area where it would be uncertain and you would have to go. So if you did re reject utility, what you're really doing is trying to go forward to determine are you in the 70% or greater range or are you in potentially the 40 to 70 range, right? You really have a meaningful difference. And so given the limitations of what we had for the study, that really fit with what they wanted to do. Uh, and you could make those more extreme by increasing the sample size. But again, remember, this is a difficult disease to recruit for. Uh, and it seemed like with the 50 subjects that we selected was a pretty, had pretty good properties for determining, A, you know, can we determine it's futile or can we provide justification to consider going forward with this in a larger uh, clinical trial? Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, so this is not basically using uh, extreme analysis and then moving forward with the same Extreme analysis was uh, uh, first stage. No, no, and we, we looked at that, and um, actually we had that in the original version, and the reviewers didn't like it, um, and so we took it out and stuff. Was that a simulation, or was that a reanalysis of the single center data to create that? No, this was a simulation, okay. right? So this was accounting for the multi-side aspect. Uh, so again, there were a lot of discussions not just right, going over the results, there was a lot of discussions that led to this, of you know, getting on the same page with what is a utility design, how could this help, right? Even getting them open to uh, you know, looking at something like this. There was time related to pull the simulations together, right? And all of this, again, the network. You could do this without the network, but it was a lot easier with the network. And I think those are the type of examples. And whether, whether it's in a network setting or not, it's important to have a group of individuals who are, who are collaborators, right? You, you can't design a clinical trial um, unless you really have a collaborative group, right? Or let me say that you can't design a successful clinical trial application, right? So if what you, and, and, and we mentioned this in the small group, you should become best friends with a statistician at your institution or somebody you have, right? Because if you, if you just pop in and it's kind of the consulting, right? I'm doing my clinical trial, I need a stat section, here's some text you can cut and paste in that. That comes across. Right. What you really want here is a well-integrated, right, statistician, you know, coordinator, clinical trial, so a, a team that you can show effectiveness, and the grant reflects that. Right. It really takes a collaboration. <laughs> because these aren't the type of things where you just write a statistical analysis plan in a half hour to an hour. You really have to understand what you're trying to do here, and make sure that the analysis plan 
matches what they're calling for clinically, but that all of these issues are already done. And also that you can lay out the sample size calculation. The sample size uh, sections for these grants are pretty complex because it lays out what were the assumptions, we did these simulations, here's a range of things, here's why we chose that, right? Another soapbox moment, statistical, is never use comments in like your grant applications. This trial has 80% power. That's a meaningless statement. Every trial has 80% power for something, right? You want to present, when you're presenting your sample size and power sets of calculations, what were your assumptions, right? It has 80% power for what effect under what type one error level, you know, and, and so, right? In other words, you need to provide enough information that someone can replicate if they wanted to, to really understand what you have. Um, in terms of just giving a little bit of, of a quick summary metrics in terms of how the network is helped on the back end. Uh, so the efficiency, it was mentioned this morning, there's at least time for contract execution, you know, CIRB protocol approval and so forth, getting, but also getting the database ready, getting subjects in and so forth. We have some data on network efficiency, and Neuronex has been around you know, longer than Strobe, not as long as NET. Um, but in terms of what we've seen in studies, um, you know, compared to meals, which is the only comparison that we have that NGH does, the meeting time from the notice of award to first subject enrolled is about 90 days shorter, so about, this is savings of about three months in terms of getting people in. Both the MS study and the Myasthenia Grava study had a recruitment rate about two times that of comparable studies in the literature if you look at clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, and, and really, this is probably our favorite figure in the entire network is, so the three studies that I mentioned in here, one is 103, 104, all recruited uh, essentially on time or right approximately on time. Even the, and the one that I think uh, is probably the most popular is the 103 was the Myasthenia Gravis. So recruiting the Myasthenia Gravis trial on time was a major, major that we're really kind of proud of as a network, but, but uh, also you know, the, the MG investigators that we're working with were really excited about that as well. So I think the benefits come from not just getting the design, but also the advantage of the collaboration is it's not just getting the grant, it's getting the grant and then making the grant successful, right? So building a full team, the statistician being involved, make sure you're looking at things, uh, coordinator, in Neuronext we have a recruitment and retention committee. Right? We often think about getting patients in and what are the recruitment, but retention is equally important. Um, the other thing that you know, your coordinator, I mentioned you should become best friends with your statistician, become best friends with the, you know, the nurse or study coordinator that you have at your sites. They're the people in the trenches that really make uh, the studies work. And you know, if you have a good coordinator, you're going to be much more likely to have a successful study. This just kind of summarizes kind of the, the accomplishments of the neurodex in general, but that's uh, I think I'll stop here. If there's any questions about specific designs or trial design in general, if you want to have a slide, I can address it. I just want to ask, what does this specific aim look like for a futility trial? I mean, how is it different? How do you make that clear in the aims? Well, the, the, the specific aim would be, it would, it would kind of be comparable, so the specific aim would be to determine whether there's sufficient evidence to move forward to a phase of trial, right? So in other words, your specific aim is you're gonna conduct a trial to determine whether it tells you it's futile to go forward or it provides evidence to justify moving forward to a phase of trial. It's very comparable, I guess, to the aim would be the aim of phase two studies, just how to get at the aim slightly different. So, you have seen the base number limitation and how much you can add in the grant. So, explain these complicated designs in the grant. It gets really challenging. Yeah, I mean, again, there's an art form to doing this. This is with inventionship. I mean, you know, a, a, a good statistician can get the stuff they need in there, whatever. Clinical aspect is don't shortchange the statistician. You know, I would argue in a clinical trial 12 page grant, you should probably allocate at least two to three pages, if not more, to the statistical aspects, right? And there are many times where you're given half a page uh, to do this. And, and, and I think you really want to make sure that you can I mean, one of the common things that I, that I, that I see a lot, this is somewhat um, you know, subjective on my part, it seems like 
you know, I, I think we all tend to focus on what we're most comfortable with and minimize what we're less comfortable with. So a lot of clinical trial applications in this 12 phase patient probably go a little, so we want to go into the background and significance, but probably go way too deep into details of preliminary studies that probably aren't necessarily relevant to the background and significance and shortchange other areas like the statistics, the sample size, assumptions that are equally important. So I mean, part of it is making sure you cover all the areas equally well. And I think, again, working with the statistician in a collaborative manner is important. So you have some if you, if you read it, and I review grants like this, if you read it where you're reading along and then here's this other section that is clearly just cut and pasted because it doesn't look anything or have any feel like the rest of the grant, and then you go back, you know, you, you start to question, you know, how well does this team work together? And, you know, part of, for, for better or for worse, I mean, part of reviewing a clinical trial application because of the cost and complexity is judging both the science of what is written, but the ability of the team to pull it off. And if, you, if it comes across as, you know, here, here's a horror story. I was once involved uh, for the situation where it became clear in the review that the statistician and the PI had never been in each other. That's not good. Trying to get you know, multiple millions of dollars for the trial. I think if that's it, I think the next is the small groups. And the. Yes, yeah, so everybody, please look on page three for your.